we just had this great opportunity to have your exhibition um, at the Palm Springs Art Museum, Gerald Clark, Falling Rock, which is, uh, I think, an incredible survey of your work to date. I'm really interested in hearing from you about how you reflect, reflected on not only the process, but you know, once the show was installed and you walked through the exhibition, what that felt like and what, you're, what was going on in your mind and what you were thinking about. Well, I think uh, one of the myths of art production is that the artist knows exactly what a piece is about and how people will respond to it. I, I haven't had the opportunity to see a lot of this work together, shown all, all at once, and it, it was a learning experience for me, and I started to see relationships in my own work. I heard comments that people made about some of the work that weren't part of my thinking making the work, but when I relook at the work and hear those comments, I'm, well, I see that, you know? And just because I made it doesn't mean that I'm the authority on the piece, you know? I think it's a very social process. Well, you know, what's interesting is uh, the wit and the humor in your work. When you, uh, when you are engaged in process, is that, um, is that part of the way you sort of introduce your thinking, introducing um, your audiences to, you know, rather complex and sometimes confrontational subject matter. You really bring the viewer in through that humor in a way that's really magical. Yeah, you know, uh, a curator uh, once uh, told me uh, that uh, humor is the shock absorber of life, you know, and I'm like, if anyone needs a shock absorber, it's Indian people, you know. Humor is a tool that I use to draw people into the work. And once you draw them into the work, my, my hope is that they, they go a little deeper beyond the humor and say, oh, well, wait a minute, this is what he's really talking about. The, the broad range and spectrum of your work, I, I mean, I love using this because, uh, you know, one of the most moving moments I had going through your show was when I saw Vanish One. Uh, and uh, I mean, the way that work resonates uh, with the public. I think the viewer is attracted to that video initially in, the, in a technical aspect. How did he do that? How did he make himself disappear? And then afterwards, uh, I think people ask the question, well, why did he do that? You know, a lot of people equate, uh, you know, being an artist with having talent. And I wish that were true. <laughs> you know, I struggle constantly in the, in the studio and, and ideas. And if I did have a talent, I think it's the ability to see things not as they are, but what, what they could be, how they could be seen. The yucca plant and then um, the branding project. And these are two pieces that are in progress right now. And I'd love for you to tell us a little bit about how um, you start with the idea, make the decision about the material, and then move forward. What led you to the decision to, to create a yucca plant out of metal? Uh, you know, the, the, so the plant is important to the Kahuya people. I want to pay homage and I want to document that history. Uh, you know, I have, I have, I, I love like modernist art, right? And so this kind of half sphere and then this kind of uh, catenary kind of arched form here, I just love formally. I just love the, the, the design of the plant, you know, nature ultimate teacher, right? Uh, when I initially, and this is two different <laughs> parts, but I initially got this part built and I was going for this kind of, you know, half spherical kind of shape. And I didn't know what this needed to look like, so I just got some tin foil, <laughs> and, and I just started crunching it around there and trying to get how the size, the shape of everything I wanted. So I've decided I'm not going to paint this in um, natural colors like the large one that's installed at the, the museum right now, but I'm actually going to powder coat this in a chrome silver, and then the rest of this is going to be a real bright metallic gold. And so I'm going to actually give it a title like gentrification. The interplay between uh, moving at, from student artist and back to you know, teaching and, and being in, a, in an educational environment or an academic setting, what are you seeing from our new generation about how they respond to you, your work, your practice, and how you approach art making? Are you, um, uh, what kind of engagement? Um, and is, this, is teaching something that you enjoy? I absolutely enjoy teaching. I think the students respond to me the best because just like what we're doing here, I'm, I'm the magician that shows you how to do all the tricks, right? So straight up front, I explain to my students that uh, I learn from them as much as they learn from me. It's not about putting knowledge on people, it's bringing it out of them, right? And that's really how I approach it. And I could show, I could show you everything I know and the work you would be doing would be totally different than what I'm doing. 
tell me about cattle ranching and, and what that's like for you. And I know it's meaningful because of, you know, both your grandfather, your father um, ranched cattle and, uh, in that, and raised cattle. So that, you know, that obviously has been passed on to you and, and your passion. There's a whole group of artists who are also cattle ranchers, you know, James Terrell, uh, Bruce Nauman, yeah, right. you know. Yeah. I have already mentioned that I love the physicality of making art, right? But then also just um, self-sufficiency, you know, and carrying on traditions, you know, family traditions were really important to me. And, you know, as an artist, I think you can start living in your head, right? And I don't think that's helpful. And there's nothing more real than when you're, you know, on the, uh, you're holding a rope and on the other end is a thousand pound steer, you know, and that's when things get real, you know. I think all these other things that I'm involved with impact what I do and, and it helps me keep it real. The branding project, which um, universally is loved by, by people who follow your work, um, it, it, it must have come out of your experiences with managing cattle and so on. But tell me how that started. And, and I see that you have a new, a new uh, series of work coming up. Uh, a lot of times I would try to get a show at a gallery or museum and they, you know, one of the first questions, is, well, do you do Native American art? And I got so tired of hearing that, you know, and so I was like, well, maybe I should make a brand and people just brand me or brand my artwork as Native American or whatever. And then that was 2002, I made the first Indian brand and it says the word Indian on it, right? And so it was just a sculpture that I, that I had made and it never occurred to me at that time to actually use it. And it was probably four years later that I was sitting there and I was thinking, I should use that thing. And so I actually got some watercolor paper. I built a big fire in the yard here and I heated it up and I actually branded that paper. It's a fun process and I, I, I refer to it as like printmaking for me because I do multiple editions and then I choose the ones that I want to sign. The violence of, of the making of the print and then that heat that comes out and each one's going to be a little different, whatever, but um, I'm not a violent person, but the history here is violent. And so I like that the branding carries that violence. With the can baskets, with the branding irons, anytime I'm working from my own life experiences, it seems like that artwork, uh, you know, just really, it hits all the cylinders for me and, um, and conveys, you know, my experience uh, as a contemporary Native person. Well, you've got, you've got some of the uh, branding irons yeah, here so, for the... So, this you know, is... these... Um, you know, first of all, people say, well, would you use that on account? Of course, I, I would never do that. Um, but, but these are based on like, this is how you would make a cattle brand. This spiral piece right here was actually from a lamp base that I found buried in my yard. And so maybe my grandparents had that and it just got lost in the, in the yard or what have you. So I, you know, there's like family history there. And you know, I, I, I do the handles a certain way and such. These here, these are be my new, uh, my new brands. And so I uh, pulled a image of ca the state of California off the internet. I simplified it slightly, saved it as a JPEG. Then I emailed the file to a friend of mine and he has this computer controlled cutter. So he can cut this perfectly uh, for me. And so I'm gonna do a series of prints, uh, brand prints uh, based on California Indian history and the history of uh, Ishi, if you know the story of Ishi, the last Yahi uh, Indian, really tragic story, and I'm going to incorporate that into uh, a new series. The uh, shaker reoccurs uh, again as an image, a form in your work throughout. Tell me why you, you cho chose to work with paint on this one and, and how this evolved as an idea. I started doing rattle paintings in the 2000s because I saw that no one was making art for the Kahuya people. And if I'm gonna call myself a Kahuya artist, it seems like I should be that one, right? But I'm thinking of some kind of decorative design through the narrow band here. And then across the, the, the wider band here uh, is gonna be a series of the shape of California across the bottom. And then maybe some kind of heart rhythm kind of line going through here. And so I'll have different designs on them and such. And so in this painting I'm doing, I'm donating it to the California Indian Nations College for them to auction off. Because that's part of that responsibility. If I'm going to call myself a Kahuya artist, I have to contribute to the community, right? I have to express what's important to the community. And sometimes I have to critique the community, right? right. That's all part, part of that responsibility. The title of the exhibition and the publication is uh, Gerald Clark Falling Rock. And um, would you recount 
where that came from because that's such an incredible title and there's a long family history to, to why you called the exhibition and the book Falling Rock. I remember coming up here into the mountains and I would see these road signs that said Falling Rock or Beware of Falling Rock. And, and you know, as a kid, I you know, six, eight years old, I had no clue what that meant. So I asked my dad and he said, oh, that's the name of the last wild Indian who never gave up to the Americans. And everywhere he was spotted attacking cars, they would put up a sign to warn people. My dad did not remember telling me that at all. You know, it's one of those things that we do as parents, you know, to entertain our kids without a second thought, but it had such a profound, you know, and every time I saw one of those signs, no matter where I was, I would be looking for him, you know? And it was like, I wanted to be with him, you know? I, I didn't want to give up, you know? And so that's kind of the spirit that I, I, t I take into the studio. And to be honest with you, I don't want to be known as the can basket guy. I don't want to be known as the branding iron guy. And so like the importance of this catalog and the importance of this show is it shows it all, right? And I'm all over the place, right? The jack of all trades, the master of none, you know? One thing walking through the show and, and looking through the, the catalog, um, I don't think you, you see a lot of artists who work like me, you know? And so I'm really happy with the catalog because it's, it's going to, you know, it's going to outlive this exhibit and it's going to outlive me. And hopefully other uh, younger artists will see it and say, oh, I don't have to be a painter. I don't have to be a photographer. I can, I can just, and, you know, I, I tell my students, quit making art. Just do what you do and call it art. Thank you.